Welcome, I'm Jan Kugel, and this segment is all about the history of GMP. For those who don't know me yet, I create videos about GMP, doing my best to make them the most exciting and rememberable as I can. My goal is to spread valuable knowledge about pharmaceutical production while sparing you the agony of learning everything from long and tedious texts. I had many requests, especially from natural science students, to do some videos about the basics of good manufacturing practices, and I would like to start with this segment. It doesn't get any more fundamental, as I will talk about the history of good manufacturing practice and the tragedies that led to its birth. This video will be appealing to industry experts, novices and complete outsiders. You will be amazed to learn how much has changed in the last 100 years in comparison to the history of the humankind. You will also see how safer our life has become thanks to GMP. So let's start at the beginning. Why do we need GMP? Let me ask you a question. When you swallow a painkiller to ease your headache after a long night out or a stressful day at work, do you ever doubt the pill's effect? Do you ever feel that you are playing Russian roulette choosing a tablet from the package, fearing that it might kill you? I hope that you answered no to those questions, and if you did, you need to thank GMP for that, or at least the people who made it a law. Because if not GMP, your answer would most certainly be yes. For those of you who are entirely new to the pharmaceutical industry, I will start with a short overview of what GMP is. GMP is a collection of guidelines which must be complied with while manufacturing pharmaceutical products, medical devices, cosmetics and food. Those guidelines are there to ensure that the consumer will get high quality and safe to use products. When a company manufactures a batch of 100,000 pills, according to GMP, they can be sure that each tablet is identical. If there is a problem, they should ideally be able to detect it in time before it reaches the consumers. To achieve those high standards, the GMP requires companies to have a robust quality system in place that monitor the smallest changes, every deviations and documentation. Manufacturers are obligated to have state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities that are operated by highly skilled workers in hygienic environment. Also, every step in the production, including who did what and when, must be documented and fully traceable. The quality control and quality assurance departments oversee each significant step according to their responsibility. If all the checkpoints fail, a drug manufacturer must be ready to receive complaints and recall its product at any moment. There is much, much more behind GMP, and the full list of requirements is long and may vary a bit from country to country and from product to product, but this should be enough for you to grasp the significance of GMP. And again, the guidelines are low and must be obeyed even in developing countries. If an establishment disregards them, it is not allowed to sell its products and if people get hurt, it means jail time. Now, how did GMP come to be? To answer this question, we need to jump into the TARDIS or a time machine for those of you who didn't spend much of their evenings watching sci-fi TV shows and travel to a few points in time. Our first destination is the USA and the year is 1900. People already had hospitals, vaccines, antiseptics and drugs, but not real oversight as Food and Drug Administration didn't exist yet. It was an excellent time for miracle workers and traveling healers. They sold exceptional elixirs on every corner that could cure anything from headaches to cancer. They worked wonders on humans and animals alike. Needless to say that some of the products were unsanitary, while others contained dangerous poison-like substances or opioids. Unfortunately, those fraud miracle workers were not the only problem, because there were no regulations also for the real drug production, which led to a chain of events that would change all of that. In 1901, St. Louis Board of Health in the USA produced a vaccine against diphtheria from the blood that they had taken from a horse named Jim. They then discovered that Jim was infected with tetanus and killed him. But it was a shame to waste perfectly good blood, so they continued to use the serum for diphtheria vaccines. As a result, 13 children died from contaminated injections. 
In a non-related case from the same year, nine children died from contaminated smallpox vaccines. Then, many deaths too late, it became clear how important it is to use high-quality raw materials for the production of drugs. That led to the formation of the Biologics Control Act, which became effective in 1902. The Act established a board to oversee the implementation of regulations of biological products. It also required that all products be labeled ac accurately with the name of the product and the address and license number of the manufacturer. The Act was the first milestone for the establishment of the FDA, but it required another push together. In 1905, a book called The Jungle drove public opinion for change. The book was a novel written by Upton Sinclair. The book talked about the exploits of immigrants in the country. The hero of the book was Jurgis Rutkus, a Lithuanian immigrant whose family slowly decayed physically and mentally because of the plant conditions in the country. His father dies because of unsafe work conditions in a meat packing plant, and his son dies from food poisoning. He also wrote about unsanitary conditions in which animals were slaughtered and processed, and the practice of selling rotten or diseased meat to the public. He also reported that the ground meat sometimes contained remains of poison traits and even unfortunate workers who fell into the machinery. Although it was a novel, the public became highly concerned with several passages exposing health violations and unsanitary practices. The uproar reached President Roosevelt, who agreed with some of Sinclair's conclusions. In 1906, his administration created the Pure Food and Drug Act, which was a series of significant consumer protection laws. To uphold those laws, the administration established the Bureau of Chemistry. The regulations required manufacturers to list active ingredients on the label of a drug's packaging and the drugs could not fall below purity levels established by the United States Pharmacopeia or the National Formulary. In 1930, the Bureau of Chemistry became the US Food and Drug Administration. It was apparent for the FDA that the biologics control and the Pure Food and Drug Acts were not enough. They gave no jurisdictions over cosmetics, medical devices, or advertising and forced no standards for foods. The FDA's chief education officer, Ruth DeFore Slam, and chief inspector George Larrick created an instrumental traveling exhibit in 1933 to highlight around 100 dangerous, deceptive, or worthless products that the FDA lacked authority to remove from the market. Because the exhibition was so shocking, it received the name the American Chamber of Horrors. The exhibit included a womb supporter that could puncture the uterus if inserted incorrectly, a weight loss drug that caused death, a hair remover that caused baldness even if not used on the head. You can find there are also lotions and creams that could cause mercury poisoning and hair dyes that could cause lead poisoning and an eyelash dye that could lead to blindness. The exhibit reached the White House's attention, but the government decided to overlook it and created no new legislation to fix the problems, and it took many more tragedies to bring real change. The first one had to do with sulfanilamide. It is an antibacterial organic compound used to reduce in infections, first prepared in 1908. In 1937, the pharmaceutical company SE Masangil Company created a new preparation of sulfanilamide. They used diethylene glycol as a solvent and called it elixir sulfanilamide. DEG is poisonous to humans, but the company's chief pharmacist and a chemist were not aware of this. As there were no regulations for drug development and clinical trials, they just released the product to the market completely untested. The company's elixir caused one of the most significant mass poisonings of the 20th century, leading to the death of 107 people, many of them children. Because of this event, the American Congress passed the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. For the first time, companies had to prove that their products were safe before marketing them. But this act was not enough to ensure reliable production methods that allow avoiding cross-contamination, and unfortunately, led the following scenario to develop. Sulfathiazole was an antimicrobial medicine which the company Winthrop Chemical used to produce. 
During manufacturing, in the year 1941, they managed to contaminate each tablet of the product with about 350 mg of phenobarbital, a drug for epilepsy, killing hundreds of people. FDA's investigation into Winthrop's sulfathiazole production and the efforts to retrieve the drug remaining on the market revealed numerous control deficiencies in the plant and severe irregularities in the firm's attempt to recall the contaminated tablets. The catastrophe led FDA to revise manufacturing and quality control requirements. For some drugs, the FDA required companies to submit samples for each lot for testing and the agency would permit the release. Yet, it was still far from the GMP regulations as we know them. It didn't solve manufacturing problems like cross-contamination. And in 1941, a company released an antimicrobial drug contaminated with epilepsy drugs, killing hundreds of people. The catastrophe led FDA to revise manufacturing and quality control requirements. But it alone didn't cut it as well. It took another world-scale event to bring a real change that finally gives us GMP. It all started in 1956, in Europe, when a drug named Thalidomid came to market. The company Chemie Gluntal marketed it as a mild sleeping pill. It also reduced morning sickness, so it became popular with pregnant women. Unfortunately, the preclinical trials were lacking at the time, and the scientists didn't test the drug on pregnant animals. Only years later, in 1962, doctors could connect the drug to about 10,000 cases of congenital disabilities, where babies were born with malformed limbs. This event caused massive concern in the USA, which finally led to the formation of good manufacturing practices for finished pharmaceuticals in 1963. It has become a law and found its way to the American Code of Federal Regulations under Section 21 parts 210 and 211. Finally, FDA could regulate clinical trials and require drugs to be tested in animals before people. It also put investigators responsible for supervising medications under study. Manufacturers couldn't bring a product to the market anymore without proof of safety and efficacy, and they were required to report unexpected adverse effects. The regulations also contained the minimum conditions for facilities, controls to be used during manufacturing, processing, packaging or holding of a drug. Drugs have to meet the requirements of the act as to safety and quality. They must have the identity, strength and purity characteristics that meet approved specifications. In 1969, the World Health Organization accepted the American GMP as an integral part of its certification scheme on the quality of pharmaceutical products. Since then, more than 100 countries have incorporated the WHO GMP provisions into their national medicinal laws, and many more countries have adopted its regulations and approach in defining their local GMP requirements. Later, in 1978, GMP for drugs was substantially revised and expanded to medical devices as well with 21 CFR 820. The regulations govern the methods used in the facilities as well as the controls used for the design, manufacture, packaging, labeling, storage, installation and servicing of all finished medical devices intended for human use. Not much later, in 1979, the American government finalized the good laboratory practice to regulate non-clinical laboratory studies for future potentially registered drugs. The journey of the GMP doesn't end here. Since its formation, there were many setbacks and problems, but it always keeps developing. And that's why we have the term CGMP, current GMP. It means that you have to keep learning and continuously improve the quality systems in the company. Nowadays, GMP is a common practice worldwide, and people rarely get hurt from harmful drugs. That's why you said no to my question at the beginning. Not that long ago, your answer would probably be different. It took about 80 years of trial and error and many catastrophes to create GMP. But it is a drop in the sea in comparison to human history. For tens of thousands of years, the life expectancy of people in the world was about 30 years old. But in the last 120 years, 
it more than doubled itself. Once an older person with a cane was a rare sight, and GMP plays a crucial role in it. Of course it has to do with science, but because of GLP and GMP, only one of 10,000 molecules would become a drug. It makes companies work harder and better to achieve potent and safe drugs. It also pushes companies to develop computer software that would simulate in hours or minutes what would have otherwise taken years in the lab. Therefore, the future looks bright and healthy for the humankind, thanks to GMP, which will always keep progressing and improving. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. If you did, share it with someone who might also find it interesting. Stay compliant and see you in the next segment.